you'll hear a woman complaining about an item she has bought. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Smart Electricals, Mike speaking. How may I help you today? Ah,、oh, good morning. I'm calling to complain about an item I recently purchased from your company. I'm not happy with it. Oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I'll take you through the company's complaints procedure. I'll need to retrieve your files from our records so that we can discuss the problem properly and find a solution. I'll need to take some details from you first. Is that okay? Okay, but I don't have a lot of time. Will it take long? Not long, madam. Can I first take your name? Yes, it's Susan York. Y O R K E. Okay. Can I have the address, please? Yes, it's flat one, twenty-five Alpine Avenue. That's A L P I N E Avenue, Harchester. The postcode is H A six five L D. Okay. Next, could you give me your telephone number, preferably one that we can call you on during normal working hours? Well, the home one is o one seven three four, five two five two six eight, but you're only likely to catch me on that number in the evenings. I usually have my mobile phone with me during the day, though. It's probably best to take that number then. All right, my mobile number is o seven eight one two double three four five two. And do you have the order reference number on you by any chance? Well, I have the receipt that the camera came with in front of me. Ah, good. Which number is it? It's a bit confusing. It should be the seven-digit number on the top left corner of your invoice. Let me have a look. I need my glasses. Found it. It's D M X eight double four three. Thanks. Now, when did you purchase the item? Well, the camera was delivered last Monday, on the first of February. I ordered it online about two weeks before that, but I can't remember the exact date. If you have another look on the invoice receipt, the date should be there. Oh yes, here it is, January the fifteenth. Okay, I'll make a note of that. So the item is a digital camera. Yes, it's the Aqua PowerShot model in silver. Thank you. Did you take out any kind of insurance when you bought it? Well, no. It was on special offer. I didn't need to pay any extra for the insurance because it came with a special four-star policy. Well, it means you're fully covered for at least another three years. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Right. What is the problem? Yes, the first thing is that it came with one memory card in the box when there were supposed to be two. Oh dear, I'm terribly sorry about that. It must have been an oversight in the packing department. I can do something about that straight away and get one sent out to you. Well, that's not the only thing. I bought it as a present for my niece because she loves swimming. It said on the website that it was waterproof, 
But when she took it on holiday and tried to use it underwater, it got ruined because water got into the lens. You can imagine how disappointed my niece was. I certainly can. Were those the only problems? No, there was one other thing. It came with a case to protect it. When I opened the box to take the case out, I saw that it had a big scratch on it. We're really sorry about that. I can offer to have the camera repaired for you. In the event that it can't be repaired, we'll send you a replacement. Um, I don't think so. Seeing as it was faulty in the first place, I wouldn't want another one. I think I'd rather have my money back. Can I get a refund? Yes, of course. If you send it back to customer services, I'll make sure it's dealt with. Thank you very much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Section two. You are going to hear a lecture about dining services. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 11 to 14. Welcome to the Dining Commons. This is the newest facility on campus, and I am proud to say also one of the best. I know that all university students miss eating home-cooked food. Well, this year, we are hoping to provide students with food and services that will make you feel at home, even without your family. The administration has been listening to the voice of the students. Students gave us frequent suggestions last year as to how we could improve the university. One of the most frequent suggestions was improving the dining options. We have been working hard all summer to come up with ideas that will make student life in the dormitories more pleasant. One of the new options we are offering in the dining facilities is variety in student meals. Last year, there was a set menu for every dinner, so if students didn't like the food, there was no choice. Students had to eat whatever was served. But this new dining facility has three completely unique areas, each with a different theme. At every meal, there will be three options for students to choose from. For example, there might be Italian food at station number one, which might consist of pizza and pasta. At station number two, there would be American food, consisting of hamburgers and hot dogs. At station number three, there could be vegetarian soups and salads, accommodating all the vegetarians. We hope that with the greater selection of food, all students will find something to their liking. Now look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 15 to 20. Not only will students have more options, the food will also be better. Each section of the facility will have a head chef. These are real chefs that have been trained in culinary school and have been hired specifically by the school to work in the dining facilities. All of the chefs have a speciality. The school is hoping that these chefs 
will prepare better tasting and more nutritious food. Every student will be able to make suggestions and also give their input as to which menus taste better. Last year, many students complained that the dining facilities didn't have very convenient hours. This year, we hope to change that. We will open for breakfast at 6 a.m. to accommodate all the early risers. In the evenings, we will open until midnight for all the students that like to go for a late night snack. The afternoons will still remain closed, but we will have a student store open that will provide all students with drinks and fruit. The student store will be open every day from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Every student that has paid full tuition and dormitory fees has already paid for their dining facility fees. Students can eat at any time and in any amount for free. If you are a student that does not live in a dormitory, you can still purchase a dining facility card. This card will entitle you to the full services of the dining facility. This card is available only for students and is not open to the general public. If you are not a student and wish to dine here, you must purchase meals at the door. There are a few rules to follow. Even though we do not limit the amount of food that can be taken, we do not want students to waste food. Please do not take more than you can eat. Also, every student must clean his or her own trays and plates. We will provide plates and trays for student use, but please do not abuse these items. Please do not leave your plates on the tables. Your parents are not here to clean up after you anymore, so I hope all students will be responsible. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the upcoming year. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. And you'll hear an introduction about the process of producing stamps. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of Tell Me More, the programme where you ask the questions and we provide the answers. And we've had a wide variety of questions from you this week. And the subject we've picked for you this week, in response to your many letters, is the production of postage stamps. And as usual, we've been doing our homework on the subject. So, who designs the postage stamps that we stick on our letters? Well, in Australia, the design of postage is in the hands of Australia Post. In Britain, it's the Royal Mail that looks after stamps, and it seems that both countries have a similar approach to the production process. We discovered, to our surprise, that it can take up to two years to produce a new postage stamp. Why is that, I hear you ask? Surprisingly, it can't be all that difficult to design a stamp. In fact, it isn't, but it seems it's a lengthy business. Firstly, they have to choose the subjects, and this is done with the help of market research. 
Members of the general public, including families, are surveyed to find out what sorts of things they would like to see on their stamps. They are given a list of possible topics and asked to rank them. A list is then presented to the advisory committee, which meets about once a month. The committee is made up of outside designers, graphic artists, and stamp collectors. If the committee likes the list, it sends it up to the board of directors, which makes the final decision. Then they commission an artist. In Australia, artists are paid one thousand five hundred dollars for a stamp design and a further eight hundred dollars if the committee actually decides to use the design. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. So there's a possibility that a stamp might be designed, but still never actually go into circulation. So what kind of topics are acceptable? Well, the most important thing is that they must be of national interest, and because a stamp needs to represent the country in some way, characters from books are popular. Or you often find national animals and birds. So, of course, the kangaroo is a favourite in Australia, with the notable exception of members of the British royal family stamps. No living people ever appear on Australian or British stamps. Every year, the Royal Mail in Britain receives about two thousand ideas for stamps, but very few of them are ever used. One favourite topic is kings and queens. For instance, King Henry the Eighth. Famous for his six wives, has recently appeared on a British stamp together with a stamp featuring each of his wives. But despite the extensive research which is done before a stamp is produced, it seems it's hard to please everybody. And apparently, all sorts of people write to the post office to say that they loved or hated a particular series. The stamp to cause the most concern ever in Australia was a picture of Father Christmas surfing at the beach. And when you consider that the practical function of a stamp is only as a receipt for postage, I think perhaps the importance accorded to stamps has got out of all proportion. Well, that's all for today. If there's a subject you want us to tell you more about, drop us a line at. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture on William Kidd. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. A pirate story, William Kidd. William Kidd, who is better known by the name Captain Kidd, was a 17th-century British privateer and semi-legendary pirate, who became celebrated in English literature as one of the most colourful outlaws of all time. Fortune seekers have hunted his buried treasure in vain through succeeding centuries. Kidd's early career is obscure. It is believed he went to sea as a youth. 
After 1689, he was sailing as a legitimate privateer for Great Britain against the French in the West Indies and off the coast of North America. In 1690, he was an established sea captain and ship owner in New York City, where he owned property. At various times, he was dispatched by both New York and Massachusetts to rid the coast of enemy privateers. In London in 1695, he received a royal commission to apprehend pirates who molested the ships of the East India Company in the Red Sea and in the Indian Ocean. Kidd sailed from Deptford on his ship, the Adventure Galley, on February 27, 1696, called at Plymouth, and arrived at New York City on July 4th to take on more men. Avoiding the normal pirate haunts, he arrived by February 1697 at the Comoro Islands off East Africa. It was apparently some time after his arrival there that Kidd, still without having taken a prize ship, decided to turn to piracy. In August 1697, he made an unsuccessful attack on ships sailing with mocha coffee from Yemen, but later took several small ships. His refusal two months later to attack a Dutch ship nearly brought his crew to mutiny, and in an angry exchange, Kidd mortally wounded his gunner, William Moore. Kidd took his most valuable prize, the Armenian ship Queda Merchant, in January 1698, and scuttled his own unseaworthy adventure galley. When he reached Anguilla in the West Indies, April 1699, he learnt that he had been denounced as a pirate. He left the Queda Merchant at the island of Hispaniola, where the ship was possibly scuttled. In any case, it disappeared with its questionable booty and sailed in a newly purchased ship, the Antonio, to New York City, where he tried to persuade the Earl of Bellamont, then colonial governor of New York, of his innocence. Bellamont, however, sent him to England for trial, and he was found guilty, May 8th and 9th, 1701, of the murder of Moore and on five indictments of piracy. Important evidence concerning two of the piracy cases was suppressed at the trial, and some observers later questioned whether the evidence was sufficient for a guilty verdict. Kidd was hanged, and some of his treasure was recovered from Gardiner's Island off Long Island. Proceeds from his effects and goods taken from the Antonio were donated to charity. In years that followed, the name of Captain Kidd has become inseparable from the romanticised concept of the swashbuckling pirate of Western fiction. Among other stories concerning caches of treasure he supposedly buried is Edgar Allan Poe's The Gold Bug. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.